Welcome to the first edition of Legislative Update for the 2024 session of the Vermont House of Representatives. Uh, my guest today, as always, is State Representative Tesha Buss of Windsor 5 uh, House District, representing Plymouth, Reading, and Woodstock. Welcome, Tesha. It's wonderful to connect with you again. Thanks for having me back, Tom. Sure, absolutely. Our topic today education issues in this session of the legislature. Uh, as we head towards town meeting day in March, education is top of mind in terms of voter concerns in the region and statewide with school budgets up for consideration in all of our communities and a controversial $99 million school bond issue to fund construction of a new high school and middle school for the Woodstock Union um, uh, for the Mountain View Supervisory Union School District. There's much to be talked about today and in the coming weeks. Uh, Tesha, you serve on the on the House Education Committee. Can you give our viewers a quick overview of the major items on the committee's agenda and the House's agenda in this session as it relates to education? And then let's go through and talk in a little bit more detail about each of those issues. You got it. Um, the we're mostly trying to address how to reduce the cost of education. Um, that will be done through addressing uh, mental health in schools, Our um, how VHI, which is the organization that um, works with healthcare and does all of the contracting. So all of our teachers that are in the union, um, they negotiate that healthcare contract. So figuring out how to reduce that um, expense. And then we are definitely talking about school construction, um, how to organize it and how to finance it so that it is done in a different way than when it was done prior to the moratorium, which was unsustainable. Uh, and then we are working very closely with our House Ways and Means Committee on Act 127, which is the pupil waiting study, which has thrown our property tax bills and how we finance education into a really big salad spinner. And it is mm. not, it has not come out the way that it was intended um, for a lot of reasons. So we had a lot of smart people at the table, but boy, they missed some details. Um, so that's the overview. Okay. Let's look at that last issue first. <laughs> and then let's talk a little bit about um, the moratorium you referenced. Um, because I don't think a lot of voters understand that topic in particular. But it, talk a little bit about Act 127, when it was enacted, which I believe was 2022, am I correct? And then... Uh, with this being the yeah. first year that it's actually acted right. on, exactly. on the ground. Right. Yeah. And, and then uh, what exactly are um, some of the unintended consequences of, of that? And what might you be looking at tweaking? Great. So we all know that we have one of the most ed equitable education financing structures in the nation due to a Supreme Court case that made us um, take all of our money up to the state level and then be distributed equitably to all schools because some towns have a high wealth value in their property and then therefore they could spend mm -hmm. a ton of money on education and a town that hardly had any property value obviously couldn't educate their kids to that same standard so we equitized education this is another layer of equity which has to do with the individual pupils so we call it pupil weighting meaning like the weight of your body and mm -hmm. you have a an, a different rate for poverty because somebody who comes from poverty might be more challenging to uh, to educate. They might need a lot more supports. Mm -hmm. um, an English language learner, um, somebody that has what's called an IEP or a 504 plan. That means they need they have special services that they need either for mm -hmm. education or social emotional um, regulation and mental health um, issues. So. If your your district takes all of your students and then they get an individual weight accordingly, and then that changes how much money you can pull into your school budget. And for the Mountain View Supervisory Union, that was actually positive. We have seven towns. And from our rural nature, which is also a weight because it costs more to transport kids from 
Pittsfield and, and other locations, um, we also got extra taxing capacity for that. Uh, so that is where the pupil waiting starts. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, if you're a town that has uh, not very many challenging students, it's not particularly rural in nature, you don't have a lot of English language learners, you are going to eventually mm -hmm. have to um, either pull back your budget or keep your, or you'll have to give mo more of your money um, basically to the state to distribute mm -hmm. more equitably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to not have them go from zero to 60 overnight. So we gave them five years to make those, you know, to make those changes. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, a school that like Mountain View Supervisory Union that gets the benefit of the weights we get the full benef benefit of the weights immediately. Mm -hmm. So it's not equitable yet. The scale is only 5% here or over the course of five years, that would be like 20% each year is, a, is the change, which mm -hmm. equals 5% of your tax rate. So mm -hmm. you've got these people being paid a full amount and these people not being paid, not paying a full amount. And so it's not every taxpayer in the state is covering for that difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And that is the main issue in education finance right now. That and that it is incredibly difficult to explain it. <laughs> I, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's been a challenge um, for, for those of us in the media to try and drill into this and simplify it as much as possible for the average reader. Um, just to talk about the waiting a bit, let me let me see if I can get an example of that. Um, basically, your baseline is one, right? One student. If you have a student who's on um, English as a second language, they might be weighted 1.2 or 1.4. Is that accurate? And um, different grades may be weighted differently depending on the resources that are um, you know, a, a pre-K student might be weighted lower than one, whereas a high school student might be rated higher than one. Is that accurate? That's right. That really so it takes more to educate a high school student because they have varying needs of and, and their education is is more robust. Right. It's not mm -hmm. extremely simple. Um, and there are way more classes that everybody wants to take. So there's more availability than there's AP classes layered on top of that. Um, there's, you know, uh, sci uh, different science and STEM classes and whatnot. And, you know, in our particular school, there's, uh, you know, a robust, um, uh, gardening program and food program. And, and so that, that always costs more. You're basically like your first grade through, I think it's sixth grade. I'm not looking at the waiting study in front of me. Um, that's usually your weight of one. And even right now we have kindergarten at a half of a half of one. So a ha it's mm -hmm. not, it's like 0. 0.64 um, mm -hmm. or 0. 0.46. There's two different ways to look at it. Um, mm -hmm. They are actually reviewing that weight and next legislative session, we'll actually see what they want to, um, to use as our pre-K weight, which makes sense that they're more than a first grader because there's, you know, in childcare, you have a one to 13 ratio. You need um, for every 13 kids, you need one teacher. Mm -hmm. So it's bound to be that mm -hmm. they will be more expensive. That will also benefit um, Mountain View Supervisory Union because we offer public pre-K. Right now, we can only um, get a half of a percent, basically, per child. I see. I see. So what are the legislators looking at in terms of trying to adjust and again, I know it's a very complex situation, but um, where are you going in and doing some minor surgery to kind of uh, bring this more into balance? Or is that yet to be determined? That is what is in the process of being determined. And it is mm. always at this time of year in the process of being determined. So in December, at December 1st, the tax commissioner commissioner will, will do a We'll, we'll provide a letter that will give a guess. And it is our best guess with the information we have at that time. Then all of the schools um, will um, put forth their final budgets. Then those will get warned at town meeting. And once they are all voted on and complete, we will know the final number. And then once we have that final number, we set the yield 
which really tells us how we're going to raise enough money on property taxes to pay for this after we know our revenues for meals and rooms and sales and use and a couple of the other small in um, revenue sources that come into the education fund. Mm -hmm. Now, what we'll look at is how much we need to raise on homestead property tax payers and then how much we will have left to set the static yield for non-homestead properties. Mm -hmm. And we have to be careful with that because it's not just that it's you know, wealthy second homeowners. Some second homeowners are not incredibly wealthy. Some are extremely wealthy. But that tax being static for everyone that's non-homestead means that it also affects all of our businesses in the state, our mm -hmm. small mom and pops. So we we have to be really, um, we, we just have to be careful and mindful. Now, we are looking at the non-homestead tax rate and to breaking, um, we want to break it into different categories so that we have the ability to tax some non-homesteaders at a higher rate than maybe our small businesses, our mom and props, our nonprofits, our mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. other people. But um, we don't have that ability yet until the next session when the tax commissioner um, brings back the recommendations to the joint assembly. And then we will, the House and the Senate will look at those numbers and that will very much change education financing on top of the fact that we are also looking at um, what an income-based system looks like. But that's hard for our non-homesteaders who don't uh, sometimes pay income tax here. Mm -hmm. So wow. we, it would be a really diverse uh, way to go about financing if we go the income way. Now, we as house education do not make this decision in just our committee. This is really how the revenue is raised in the state is a ways and means committee mm -hmm, vision. Mm -hmm. We we interface with them about needing to make sure that that amount of money that is raised satisfies the needs of our Vermont kids. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you say next legislative session, you're saying that this will be um, dealt with in the 2025-26 biennium, is that correct? That's correct. Right, right. Okay. And when you reference they in terms of setting these weights and um, uh, putting these, are you talking about the state agency of education? Is that who is? Um, we, the, the agency of education, along with, uh, we hired um, folks to do studies for us on how uh, pupil weights are done throughout the country. And okay. then we ran them through the lens of what that means in Vermont. Because a lot okay. of times the study will, will put forth information, but it doesn't mean that it, it actually perfectly fits um, our unique nature here. Got it. Okay. Now let's shift gears and talk a little bit about you referenced a moratorium earlier, and I keep hearing and talking to people on both sides of the school bond issue uh, here in the uh, Mountain View Supervisory Union District. Um, I keep hearing about a, a moratorium that went in effect in the mid 2000s and 10s. I think it was somewhere around 2006, 2007 that related to statewide funding in support of um, school building efforts. Can you talk about that a little bit and and what the impact of that moratorium has been and whether we might now um, be moving back into some kind of a more um, uh, sub substantive role for the state in funding building? Yes. So 2007 is when we stopped funding school construction. And one of the reasons is that we we got a little too ahead of ourselves um, in some aspects of construction. We um, we were constructing a, a ton of brand new uh, career and technical education centers. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of school needs. What we were doing, uh, but I think how we got ahead of ourselves the most is just an an old way that we thought about financing, which was. The, the state would contribute 30%. Now to some projects, it can, it contributed much more than 30%. Um, but it wasn't just those that broke that system. You know, um, the economy was starting to take a downturn at that time. We all know what happened in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, but what we did at that time is you would 
finish your school construction project, let's say that that it is was a brand new school build and it was a hundred hundred million dollars, then the state would and 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 let's say also that that hundred million dollars was um, fully reimbursed expenses. So basically, you couldn't build um, an Olympic sized swimming pool and say you have a swim team for your school and get that reimbursed by the state of Vermont. That would be mm -hmm. something additionally that wouldn't be a reimbursable expense. So right. let's say that 100, 100 million, all of it's reimbursable, the state would then give the school $30 million. Now, what it did to the state was that meant it had to immediately take on $30 million worth of debt right then and there. And that was too much for the state to be able to hold consistently. So now what we're looking at is studying Massachusetts and Rhode Island who also had moratoriums on school construction, not as long as ours, but, but you know, but substantial. And mm -hmm. what they're doing is actually financing bond payments. So if our first year at Mountain View Supervisory Union is a $7 million payment for the, the bond of the new school, the mm -hmm. state would contribute 30% of the 7 uh, million, assuming okay. the 7 million all contributed to reimbursable expenses. I see. I see. But right now the state is contributing nothing. Correct? Nothing. That so so correct. so the entire burden um uh of repayment is on the school district and presumably the taxpayers or whatever whatever other resources might be at the disposal of the district to help defray yes. those costs. Is that correct? That is uh, correct. And wow. the issue with 127 is that schools that um that don't benefit from the weight, but they only are, uh, they, what they're doing is they are bankrolling a bunch of cash right now to prepare mm -hmm. for those years when they have to do a significant amount of cuts. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're bankrolling that cash and going straight into major construction projects so that they um, so that they won't have those expenses when they reach that end of five years. That's adding mm -hmm. additional pressure to the issues of 127. And and, and uh, in the case of Mountain Views, uh, it, uh, are we are we in that situation here in the Mountain Views district? Or we benefit, um, so yeah. we will not have to worry about you know at the end of five years we're not going to have to make extreme cuts or um, or raise our taxes considerably um, because we benefit from the pupil waiting. And, and um, how about across the seven towns? There's this CLA, right? The, um, uh, w where you adjust across towns to, to equalize um, towns that are, um, I don't wanna say more economically disadvantaged, but not as economically advantaged as others in, and, and that's where the equalization comes into place, right? Is through this, um, this CLA and the. You know, well, the CLA accurate? is the it's the common level of appraisal, and I right. I always feel like it really just brings your property up to fair market value. I see. Okay. That's really its only intended um, purpose, and so it's really important to understand that, to know that that has nothing to do with how much the school is spending or not spending. Mm -hmm. That is only if, if we did a town-wide appraisal every year, we wouldn't have a CLA. You'd always be at zero. Right. Okay. But because you did a town-wide appraisal 15 years ago and property values have gone up significantly, it's going to raise your tax rate to bring you to what your what your home should be valued at today. Mm -hmm. Because if you bought it, you know, a long time ago for a hundred thousand dollars, and you know, and today it's worth four hundred thousand dollars, we can't raise enough money to educate our kids at the one hundred thousand dollars. We have to bring you up to what your your property is really valued at. Mm -hmm. um, what's the likelihood? Will will a lifting of the moratorium or um, some kind of revision of the way? Um, new building funding worked previously. Um, is that likely to happen in this legislative session or will that flip into 2025, 26 as well? It will flip into 25, 26. But mm -hmm. what we are going to do is put forth a bill that that sets us up to do that. Um, so right now we're, we're doing a full um, needs assessment 
in a in a, a far more calculated way. Like before, we did a, a needs assessment that was self reported. Mm -hmm. This is not self reported. Um, we do uh, the AOE has hired extra people to dig into this, so we really have an understanding. And what it's also going to do is look at if your school is beyond 60 to 65% of its natural lifespan, mm -hmm. it's most likely not going to allow for that project to be renovated. Because when you go to renovate, you are not only, you, you might be able to bring things up to somewhat commercial code. You might be able to meet most of your um, ADA requirements, which is um, for handicap accessibility. Sure, sure. But it's also not going to meet 21st century learning, how we set up classrooms to to better assist our kids in in their educational outcomes. Mm -hmm. and so um, a project, if we ran through the bond right now for Mountain Views, and what I anticipate our new uh, school construction would be, we would not be advised to renovate. We would be advised mm -hmm. to Absolutely. build a new. Now, whether or not they will, whether or not the agency of education will have absolute final say, or it will still be a local decision, it, it might be still a local decision. Um, but if it is a local decision, there might be consequences on how much reimbursable expenses there are in renovation versus final construction. Some of those might have to be with what they call swing space. So if we have to renovate, we have to put those kids in a swing space for right. three to four years that we don't have a school. And mm -hmm. so we don't have the cost estimates of what that will be. And if that that could actually bring renovation into a much higher cost mm -hmm. than a full build, which would be which would not relocate kids. It will relocate football, but won't relocate all of our kids all day long for mm -hmm, years. Mm -hmm. and, and we have the challenge here in the region of there is no readily identifiable space of the size to handle 450 to 500 students in a relocation situation. I mean, it just, it doesn't exist. Really. And it doesn't exist for uh, most of the schools that are in Rhode Island as well. So they have trailers that they pull up and park and, and, and kids get educated in, in trailers, but mm -hmm. they usually have a minimum, uh, I mean, a maximum of two years that they use swing space for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it is Absolutely. essentially what I've been gathering from my research and testimony. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, this has been very thorough coverage of, of, um, of this particular issue, especially as it's so germane to our region right now. Um, if, if, uh, a new, um, statewide school building funding program is adopted in the next legislative session. And presuming that um, Mountain View's voters pass the school bond in March, will the funding be retroactive? So that is what the House Education Committee is definitely looking at. Mm -hmm. And because we've been talking about this need for some time and have not been able to pull all the pieces together to make it transpire a lot of it due to covid and the flooding this sure. summer um sure. it looks as if there will be what's called a look back we will look back so many years and and then help projects that started so many years ago right mm -hmm. now the number that's being floated is five years because mm -hmm. by the time we get this enacted um it will also coincide from when we started testing for PCBs. And so those two things uh, might have to align. And I think that's that's going to be our main target is if we needed renovations due to PCBs and we already have to cover us, whatever the PCB portion is, then that might just be the perfect time to start the, mm -hmm. the construction timeline. And of course, the perfect, the, the most uh, publicly, uh, uh, the most widely known example of that is Burlington, right? That's I mean, right. Burlington has had to build an entirely new high school, move out of their uh, complex for several years now and move into the old Macy's department building in downtown Burlington. Um, and, and that's where all the high school classes are meeting now. So, yeah. and that was because of a BCB situation. Um, 
Wow, there's so many interwoven layers to uh, to this subject that it's just um, uh, I really appreciate your taking the time to uh, to work with me and uh, try and explain this to viewers. Um, uh, heads are still spinning. I think it's really a, yeah. It's, it's there's an, a lot to spin upon. <laughs> absolutely. Well, Tesha, I really appreciate this. I'm sure we'll be coming back to this topic uh, in the coming weeks here on Legislative Update, and uh, we'll be following other House issues with you as well from now through the end of the session. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely.